So one of the first things that I want to talk to you about is our sleep and what sleep actually looks like. What most people don't realize is that we actually go through multiple stages of sleep and cycles through our sleep throughout the course of the night. And so what happens is this lovely representation that looks like a staircase here is a rough estimation of what our sleep looks like. So if we think of it this way, so as I'm going to kind of segment off here, this first piece, this is what we would call stage one sleep. During this time, this is where we're starting to fall asleep. A lot of times people experience that myoclonic jerk, that feeling of falling. That's where a lot of that idea of falling asleep comes from. During this stage, on average, if you are a healthy sleeper, it usually should take about 10 to 15 minutes where you're falling asleep. And then as you're in this first stage one sleep where our senses are shutting down, we're really getting into this, that our body's getting into that rhythm of sleep. From stage one, we then transition into stage two sleep. Right now, the best way to think about stage two is a transition stage. If you've ever driven a car with a manual transmission, we don't go from first gear to third gear without going through second. Then we have stage three sleep. And so at this point, for stage three, this is gonna be what you hear people talk about deep sleep. If you've ever done a sleep study, you might hear somebody call it slow wave sleep. This is gonna be the point where our body is gonna be repairing itself. So for this whole stage one, stage two, stage three, this is all going to be one cycle through our sleep. This is for most people going to last about 90 to 110 minutes. So for this whole cycle, it's going to last about an hour and a half to almost two hours. If you notice what's missing is we haven't said anything about our mind yet. We haven't talked about dreams, memory, attention, focus, concentration, all these things that are so important for us throughout the course of the day. So what happens is after we get through one cycle of sleep, the system's gonna, the cycle is gonna start over. But we don't need to go through stage one sleep again because we're not having to fall asleep again. So instead, stage one is now gonna be replaced with REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And so for REM sleep, this is where we're gonna be dreaming. This is where we're gonna have all of those brain components where throughout, it's going through what we've done throughout the course of the day and going sifting through the files and figuring out what do I need to remember long term? What do I put in that filing cabinet? What wasn't important? Maybe it doesn't matter what I have for breakfast. I don't have to remember that the next day. What things am I still working on? And so after we have our REM sleep, then we're going to transition back through stage two, stage three, and throughout the course of the night we're going to go back and forth between our mind repairing and our body repairing. Now, one of the important things to understand is that from an evolutionary perspective, our body is going to be repaired first. We are in our tent and we're in the middle of the woods and we hear a loud noise. We want our legs to work to run away from whatever the predator is versus being stuck in the tent and not being able to get away but being able to determine whether it's a lion or a bear. So how that works practically is at the beginning of the night, we're going to spend a lot of time in stage three sleep and very little time in REM sleep. Throughout the course of the night, we're going to see that transition where we're seeing more of an equal balance. And by the end of the night, we're going to be spending a lot more time in REM sleep and a lot less in stage three sleep. That's why we have a lot more of our dreams in the early morning hours. And if we wake up and go back into our dream sleep, we're going to see a lot more of that REM sleep in these early morning hours. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight and talk about here is the fact that one, when we wake up in the middle of the course of the night, we don't just fall back to sleep and pick up where we left off. So if we've been sleeping for a few hours and we wake up, then we have to start over again and start over again. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have what we call consolidated sleep and that we're sleeping straight through the night. So that's where your sleep window is going to come into play. What we know is that one of the most important things that we can do for our sleep is to have a set bedtime and a set wake time seven days a week. And so what that's going to look like and how we're going to calculate this and figure this out for you because everybody wonders, well, what's my ideal amount of sleep? Am I supposed to get eight hours of sleep? That's what I've learned through society. And what we know is that the amount of sleep that we need is the same thing as a shoe size. It's an average. So while the average person may need eight hours of sleep, some people need more and some people need less. You might have the average woman's shoe size at an eight or a nine, but some people wear a 10 and some people wear a six and a half. So to figure out what your ideal sleep window is, is first we're going to look at in a 24-hour period, in your full day, how much sleep are you actually getting? 
Are you taking a nap during the day? Are you falling asleep and sleeping for two hours, waking up, falling back to sleep? If we look cumulatively throughout the entire course of the day, say for you, you're getting right now about seven hours of sleep. Then what we would do is say, okay, what is the earliest that you have to wake up across those seven days? Do you have some days where you wake up at five and some days where you wake up at seven? Well, five is the earliest that you wake up. That's gonna be your set wake time now for seven days. We're gonna wake up at five in the morning and since you're getting seven hours of sleep, we're gonna work backwards. So that would mean that we'd be going to bed at 10 o'clock and waking up at 5 a.m. And so that's gonna be that seven hours, but we're gonna do that seven days a week. If we were thinking of, think of sleep and hunger on a lot of the same systems, we wouldn't diet during the week and then have all kinds of unhealthy snacks and desserts on the weekend. We would wanna do all seven days to keep ourselves on that healthy regimen. It's the same thing with our sleep. So we're not gonna be able to get less sleep during the week and then catch up on our sleep on the weekends and then throw that schedule off. The most healthy thing you can do for your body is have that fixed bedtime and wake time seven days a week. And so what we wanna do is to calculate that and to figure that out, let me give you an example. So if you have ever made pizza or you've ever seen pizza dough, if I have six inches of pizza dough and I'm gonna put that in a six inch pie pan and I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna spread it all the way out we're gonna see that that piece of dough is gonna be nice and even and thick, there's no holes, it's spread out thoroughly and evenly. Now I'm gonna take that same six inches of pizza dough and I'm gonna put that in a 10 inch pie pan. If we think of what that piece of dough is gonna look like, it's gonna be thin in spots. There might be gaps or holes because I'm trying to force six hours into a 10, 10 inch pie pan. Just like I'm trying to squeeze six hours into 10 hours of time in bed. So what I, my goal for you is I want to help you to be a more efficient sleeper. I want you to be able to fall asleep within 10 to 15 minutes, sleep straight through the night, and when you wake up, feel rested and ready to get out of bed right away, not lying in bed, not hitting that snooze button, which we can talk about in our longer sessions of why we don't want to do that, and also not taking our naps during the day. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have enough sleepiness to be able to sleep all the way through the night because if we are tired enough to sleep as long as our body needs, then we're going to be cheating ourselves out of the REM sleep later on throughout the course of the night. So we might feel rested, but our mind isn't exactly where we want it to be from a memory, attention, and focus standpoint. Now, as we've been talking about pizza, I know we all might be thinking a little bit more about food, so I do want to touch on that point as well. Is that, you know, you, I don't want to ever tell you to go to bed hungry. It's okay to have a light snack but we don't want to be eating too much before bed. So our body is having to balance, is it processing the food? Is it going to be helping us to sleep and then the food is sitting there? Additionally, liquids are another piece. A lot of people like to have that glass of something to drink before bed and they want to be able to have that water if they wake up in the middle of the night. One of the important keys to know, and I always say we don't want to, you know, don't feed the bears, don't feed your sleep is that if we are waking up in the middle of the night, we always have that midnight snack, we always have that full glass of water, our body is gonna learn that that's when it gets nutrients. So guess what it's gonna do? It's gonna keep waking you up in the middle of the night to keep having that. So we wanna make sure that if we do wake up in the middle of the night, even those of you that maybe have teenage boys at home, they don't need to eat a steak at two o'clock in the morning, although they always seem hungry and are ravaging your pantry, we wanna make sure that we are not feeding our sleep in the middle of the night so that our body is learning to sleep straight through and that we're gonna feed it at a different time. Also, we don't wanna to have too many liquids before bedtime so our bladder also isn't waking us up in the middle of the night. Along the lines of liquids and things as well, we also want to think about that fabulous thing called caffeine. So if anybody wants to take any guess of how long it takes our bodies to be able to get rid of that caffeine, most people are surprised to learn that it takes on average about seven to eight hours for your body to metabolize the caffeine in one cup of coffee. So when you're having that cup of coffee at eight or nine o'clock at night at the end of your dinner, and then you're wondering why it's difficult for you to fall asleep, it's because we're taking on so much of this caffeine and our body hasn't had the chance to process it out. So just some food for thought. That's why we usually would recommend if you're gonna have your coffee, have it of course in the morning. A lot of people need that to be able to wake up. But once you're adhering to your ideal sleep window, you're not gonna be needing that as much anymore. The other thing with that sleep window to jump back is that we wanna be going to bed, waking up at the same time well, if we do that now for the next seven days, and you say, okay, I'm getting seven hours right now, I'm doing a 10 to five, and at the end of those seven days,
the days, if you wake up and you realize you're still feeling tired, or you're feeling that dip or that fatigue throughout the course of the day, then after seven days, we get to give you the gift of more sleep. But how we're going to adjust it is we are going to actually do it in 15 minute increments. I know 15 minutes may not seem like a lot, but 15 minutes is enough to completely shift the entire cycle. So what we want to do is we're going to add 15 minutes to the bedtime. We're not going to stay in bed longer. That 5 a.m., whatever we start with, that's going to be that set wake time. But instead of going to bed at 10, now we're going to go to bed at 9.45. We're going to do that for seven days. And if we're still feeling tired, then the next time we're going to add another 15 minutes until we get to that ideal sleep window for you. Where again, the benchmarks, we're falling asleep within 10 to 15 minutes, we're sleeping straight through the night, and we're waking up the next day feeling rested. And then of course the last piece is that we're not feeling tired or exhausted or fatigued on average throughout the rest of the day. If you do have the occasional time where you're feeling more tired, that can then be the indication for you that maybe you are getting a little bit sick and you need a little bit of rest. Or maybe there's something going on that is mentally fatiguing you or stressing you, and then we can make those adjustments. But we don't want to just be extending our time in bed, and if we've had a night where we maybe went to bed later, instead of going to bed at 10 o'clock, we went to bed at 11 or 12 because we had a fun night with our friends or there was a, something we wanted to watch on television, we had to work late. The key is going to be to still wake up at 5 a.m. the next day. We don't want to then extend and sleep longer because then we won't have that chance to build up enough sleepiness to be tired or fall asleep at our set bedtime the next night. Of course, there are always exceptions to the rules. I'm not saying that you will never have a weekend sleep in or have a vacation where you're adjusting your sleep, but we need to make sure we have the rules set so we can have exceptions instead of being all over the place with that. Now along those same lines, one of the last things I want to talk to you about is how we are using our bed and using our bedroom as well. So for a lot of folks, they have this routine where they're going to get time for bed, they're going to get in bed, they're going to be watching television, they're going to be watching Netflix, they're reading their emails, they're getting connected with this. And what we find is that we actually don't want to be using our bed for anything other than sleep. Your bed should be reserved for sleep and sex and that's it. Because what happens is that our brains get confused. They wonder, well, am I supposed to be awake right now? Am I supposed to be falling asleep right now? What am I supposed to be doing? So what we find is that whenever we are getting through everything we need to do throughout the course of the evening, now when it's time for bed, we're going to get in bed, shut off the lights, and that's conditioning our body to learn that bed is sleep. Think of it this way. If I asked you if you were going to go to the cinema, if you were going to go to the movies, what snack would you have? Most people would think popcorn. Now, it doesn't mean you won't have snow caps or a soda or anything else, but in general, you think movies, popcorn. That's a strong connection. You want your brain to see your bed and think bed, sleep. You want it to be able to have that, and that's going to help you to get in bed and to fall asleep faster. If your brain is like, well, sometimes I'm watching television, sometimes I'm reading a book, sometimes I'm checking my email, all of those things, then we're breaking that connection. It's not as strong. It's going to be a lot easier. Now, a lot of people will be watching television or checking their emails or doing other things because their mind is running and racing and they're trying to distract it so they're able to fall asleep. There are some definite skills that we can do. We don't have to just take a medication to be able to shut off our brain, but that's something that we're going to get into more in depth when we do some of our longer sleep programs for you. So I will leave you with that teaser to know that there are options, but right now the key is to recognize that we don't want to be using our bed for things other than sleep or sleep and sex. However, Along those same lines, we also don't want to be spending a lot of time in bed with our mind running and racing. We don't want to be connecting our bed 